don't know me, my name is Sarah Gibbons, and I'm very pleased and honored today to be the mediator of Idea Labs. Um, let's give a quick round of applause for all of our speakers here and for Brianna, our Idea Labs coordinator. Thank you. It's actually a different presentation, you guys. We have a lot of fun. Um, and of course, we'd also like to start off by acknowledging that Concordia is on unceded territories. And we respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future relationships with the indigenous cultures. So I'm here to just talk a little bit about the basics of STEAM, so we're all on the same page here. That's me. <laughs> all right, STEAM. Um, all right, so, Steve, most of us here, uh, as far as I can tell, are from the Faculty of Fine Arts. Uh, and I believe that the arts is the expression of the human condition. It's the vessel that propels us forward to actually question the world around us. It's the history, philosophy, um, all of the humanities. With that being said, I believe that business, math, sciences, and engineering, those are the tools that equip us to answer they're inextricably tied together, one and the other. Creative thinking for creative solutions. All right, so why integrate the arts into STEM? Um, well, and also, what is STEM? Uh, this is an explanation from the University of San Diego that I like very much, and I'm gonna put this for you here. The world used to be static, and so were the building blocks our students used to make sense of the world. Our world now is highly interactive. Technology is integrated into all aspects of our lives, from social interactions to the most private parts of our lives. To make sense of this new world, our students need to be comfortable with technology, have a good understanding of how it works, and have ideas of how to innovate in all of their fields. All right. Uh, STEAM is actually the first initiative that was championed by the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, and the quote before here, received from RISD, is the goal is to foster the true innovation that comes with combining the mind of a scientist with that of an artist or designer. All right, the addition of the arts to the original STEM framework is important due to the fact that practices such as modeling, critiquing, discussing explanations of things, uh, and engaging with one another are too often underrepresented in the sciences and the maths of education. A 2014 study published by the American Society for Engineering Education identified several characteristics of quality STEM programs, which is here. And I'm gonna ask you guys to participate with me. Um, can anyone read the first one? The context is motivated engaging with people like next. Students acquire meaningful content by engaging in challenges through a design thinking process. Next. I'll do it. Teaching methods are inquiry based and student centered, with teamwork and communication a major focus. And lastly, students have to fail to think critically, creatively, innovatively, as well as the ability to fail and try again in a safe environment. Great, thank you. Now, does that sound like any of your classes? I hope it does. Um, yeah, it's a new framework for what we consider relative content, relevant content for what we're preparing our students for. There we go. All right. I believe that similar parameters would benefit our students and better prepare them for practical solutions in all aspects of their lives and provide them with a greater job viability. So why is STEAM important? Why are we talking about it today? Uh, according to the Department of Labor, more than 65% of today's students will have careers that do not exist yet. A point to make here is the goal of STEAM is to give every student an equal opportunity to identify themselves as innovators and change makers that can, be, that can take active roles in inventing solutions for the problems that they care about. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, someone that I'm very fond of. Her name is Ruth Katchen. She is an artist and educator turned STEAM enthusiast. 
She states that the arts are a great learning tool and can serve as an on-ramp to STEM for underrepresented and marginalized individuals. Engaging students' strengths using art activities increases motivation and their ability to succeed. She views art as a way of offering more diverse learning opportunities and greater access for all types of, of users. So we need to keep in mind that neurodiversity is very important. The ways in which we apply this information to students is support, regardless of what we're teaching them. And lastly, I'd like to point out that these skills that students gain from esteem education. Oops, whoa. <laughs> Talk about, oh my. Yeah, I'm spoiling everything for you guys. There we go. These clickers are so fancy. Um, yeah, the skills that they gain uh, can be translated into almost every career. Uh, Stephen DeAngelis, president of Intera Solutions and nationally recognized by Esquire and Forbes for innovation, said educating students in these subjects, if taught correctly, prepares students for life, regardless of the profession that they choose. These subjects teach students how to critically think, how to solve problems, skills that can be used throughout life to help them get through tough times take advantage of opportunities whenever they appear. Now, I also share this with you. For those that don't know my story, I came to Montreal about four years ago and have since experienced about uh, 20 more years of life-altering events and adversity. Uh, and I consider myself very fortunate that I was able to make through it. I was able to go through those tough times and equip myself with the skills I needed to get through it. But recently, I took another chance. I was accepted into the Graduate Certificate Program of Innovation, Technology, and Society in partnership with District 3. And I can honestly say that this is the first time in a long time that I feel empowered enough to make a real difference in the world, that I can be the best there I can be. I attribute this greatly to my program director, Leia, and one of my cohort here today, Paula, thank you for coming. Um, but I also recognize that my immersion in a non-binary educational system uh, has given me a clear path, real opportunities, and tools to go out to the world to make things and fix things. And that is what I was meant to do. This feeling, this hope that I have now, this is what we should aspire to instill in all of our students. up a bit more. If I could give you a history more of what sport, sport space is, I guess I was kind of planning on talking a little bit more specifically on some of the technical navigations that we did to make it happen. It used to be the bookstore. And I do like the idea kind of that, you know, what was once a focus on sort of selling printed knowledge has changed a little bit. It's still possible. And the idea with Forspace was to try to find a way to see like what does research look like across the campus, across the faculties, and have a space where that could kind of be made public. Uh, and so the transformation of the LB103, this space, was kind of at the uh, surface of that. Um, and I kind of feel like just with the this installation or uh, introduction that and knowing that there were some really smart people kind of coming up with these initial ideas, that it, it kind of comes out of like putting the A into STEAM approach. The whole kind of force space vision is that, although now it's kind of trying to serve a lot of uh, the, across the four faculties uh, in, in, a, in a wider uh, perspective and to kind of allow that discussion to happen in public. Um, 
So for space was trying to do and is trying to become a space like active assembly, messy, where things can happen in sort of a contrast to a, a more calibrated exhibition environment. Um, and to that end, we've tried to build it that way. Um, and that would be kind of a tour around all the little details that make that hopefully possible. And this is just the first, we opened yesterday, iteration of a constantly changing sequence of installations, video, workshops, demonstrations. Hydrofloor has been developing their uh, project at the greenhouse, and they're bringing it here, and they're working on it over the week. So things that are happening at different time scales to kind of achieve this kind of messy working environment. How to bring other life into the space is we almost kind of come get, get some plants in the But that, that is like kind of a reference to a couple different things, like different types of life, different types of conversations, um, different types of research practice. Uh, when you start jumping faculty to faculty, you start encountering sort of different cultural suggestions of what research is, how it's disseminated, how it's discussed. Uh, and Four Space is trying to do that and interact with that, and our team is meeting with researchers across the university and trying to make sense of how to bring things here in a way that works for everyone and somehow is engaging. So that's the other life, as well as the fact that we have drains, which is sort of a thing. <laughs> this is just like a little, like from Excel, I just wanted one of the things we did way, way, way back was to just like start making a list of technical requirements we thought a space like this might need. And giving them kind of rating so that we could try to make sense of how do you make a crazy multi-tool that can do something sort of okay. You know, multi-tools. Yeah. Uh, and just maybe my last comment, I think, because I'd like to talk about this more maybe later when I'm on, you know, on where to find me, is acoustics were up at the top. And this is a big concrete floor glass box. And we put that high up on the list because ultimately conversations need to happen. Presentations without microphones are different. Uh, quiet conversation zones, like the back room is specifically for that, is a great way to connect, discuss, have ideas. And kind of things. That's my uh, few slides on. Thanks. Continue. Uh, I'd like to give a quick rundown. Uh, each presentation will be about four minutes, uh, and then after that point, um, within the hour mark, we will have one more presenter come to us uh, at 5:30, a little bit later. But we'll also have a breakout session in which we'll all come together to discuss different ways that we can consider the way we use our spaces and then uh, the way in which we teach our students regarding STEAM. Uh, so, without further ado, Janice. Thank you. Wow, it's so exciting to be here. I can't waste a minute though, so I'm going to do a great <laughs>
salads are being made and eaten, university students are challenged with 13 green bags of clothing waste diverting from the landfill to the storefront art hive in the south. The intentional deconstruction of unsustainable practices serve as a starting point to critically analyze the garment's life cycle. From the natural and human resources compromised to the sweatshops of construction, the journey through consumer use to the garment's final premature resting place. A professor of fashion design is invited to present at the next science shop to understand the fashion industry's responsibility in this cycle and to finally understand why some clothes just don't fit them. Over time, the students and communities find ways to transform the waste into usable craft materials and a sense of abundance is experienced. A gift economy emerges as materials are shared freely across a developing network and mobilizing multiple practices and interdisciplinary partnerships. While salads are being made in the north and fashion deconstructed in the south, other communities initiate their own sites of creation and transformation. <laughs> Science shop conversations are piloted to respond to questions arising from these interactions. A science shop is a flexible model developed in the Netherlands, connecting the expertise of the university to specific needs expressed by the community. The science shop serves to democratize the tools of inquiry and make STEAM more publicly available. This helps assure that the tools being generated through the university's industry is relevant. It becomes quickly evident that groups organizing have their own funds of knowledge. Through the Art Hives network, neighbors teach their skills, sharing what works for them. More institutions open their doors to host sites of creation, deconstruction, and critical thinking, giving hope that the unorganized public can participate in social change through shifting practices and policies. Concordia's University's Art Hive opens. Alongside the Museum, Museum Art Hive and McGill Art Hive, the mighty three provide access to the salad makers, the fashion deconstructors, the gray panthers, and others missing in action. By now, the network hosts over 150 art hives, welcoming everyone an artist and everyone a scientist, fostering diverse studio relationships across academic silos, competing professions and other socially constructed divides. Through a regular practice of conversation and spontaneous informal art making, things are made, beliefs are challenged, and new methods and materials emerge that lead to participatory inquiry. Formal institutions soften their larger-than-life aesthetics to open space, embrace not knowing so that others may have a place at the table. And so we 
knew each other for a week, and we booked our plane tickets, and we went off to do this field work together and stay in, like and camp. So, like you know, it was a full on just get to know someone through a, a shared interest. Um, and what happened through that process was we went there looking for a specific thing, uh, but we didn't we didn't find that. And so what happened was an artist and a geologist were standing on this beach looking at this evidence of pollution. And through our conversation at the get-go of the research, the research evolved. And I ended up making artworks out of it. Uh, we both uh, ended up co uh, co-writing the scientific paper that came out of it, proposing that the substance we were looking at, which we uh, described as plastic glomerate is the name for it, uh, has the potential to enter the future rock record of the Earth. Uh, so a geologist from the future could take a core sample, and she would see that our times are demarcated by a plastic strata. Uh, pretty serious stuff. Uh, those specimens look like this. Uh, and they exist in the world as cultural objects that exhibit in art galleries, museums, uh, but also as scientific specimens that are studied uh, and researched in science. So we're both really interested in the hybrid nature of them and the different roles that they can play. For me, it's super important that they exist in art galleries because when you walk into an art gallery, you expect questions. You don't necessarily expect answers. If, when these are in a natural history museum, they operate differently. There's a panel on the wall, you read the panel, oh, I understand that, and move on. There's so much we need to think about how, why we are where we are now and where we're going through these objects that I believe museums, art galleries, art objects offer. Okay. I'm going to screen ahead to where we are now. I have 2018. Uh, this has led to a, sh a big shirt project that we're currently in year two. So Patricia and I and I are now a team of about 10 people that include a whole bunch of different scientists, artists, philosophers, writers. Um, and the, the basis of our project is that uh, artists and science will work together from the get-go of a research inquiry. And in doing so, both outcomes should be better. So the scientists are challenging us artists to actually learn the science and use it properly and ethically and responsibly. Us artists are also playing an important role with the scientists because we can ask questions about cultural ramifications, ethics, um, knowledge systems, flaws in scientific knowledge, um, and what we're finding is it's been a really fruitful, it is a really fruitful uh, collaboration because we're open to each other's input and critique. Um, and I'm probably out of time. That's it. So that's good. I'll leave you hanging. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs>
pretty much like nothing because they're all failed 3D prints. And we have so many of them. Actually, in the last two months, we've managed to gather about 1.5 kilogram worth of plastic. And the sample that I'm passing around is a little experimentation that I went through. I thought, how could I just, how can I use this and go away from this larger scheme of recycling? Because in the end, I think that the large scheme of recycling is not helping the individual. When we just put a plastic bottle in our recycling bin, what happens to that bottle? We lose complete interest, we lose complete, we don't see the value in the object that we just threw away. So, what can we do? Well, out there, there are people that started helping uh, that sort of train process of what can we do with plastic waste? Well, there are thousands of ways, and one coming from uh, precious plastic is, is actually uh, bringing the process closer to people. And they came up uh, and they shared blueprints of machines that people can build at home and do themselves. So we have some injection molding techniques, we have some shredding, uh, we have an oven with a compressor, all of that are to make stuff out of waste, out of plastic. Um, and here are only a very quick, quick, quick example of the things that could be made uh, from plastic. And I keep on wondering, what if Concordia had somewhere up there on the 8th floor a place where students and staff and everyone involved in the making process could think like that, could see a plastic bottle and see a huge potential in using that bottle to make a lamp, a vase, trinkets, Christmas gifts, whatever. So what if I actually made my lamp from some sort of material that looked like this? I could go to the... Uh, um, oven compressor make myself a sheet and bend my plastic the way I did with my freshly new that I just filled up with plastic on. What if we could actually see a bigger value in plastic by lowering the scale of the recycling process and actually bringing power to the students in a way that they could produce you know, their own material, their own fresh sheet of plastic from the ghetto, from a small scale. Well, next. every single aspect of faculty planners, professors, administrators, uh, people who make things go, uh, and then also the technicians, which Eugene, Tom, Brianna, four, yeah, Tom. Five, six. Tom. <laughs> Did everyone look at this? Yeah. You keep pointing to Tom. Oh, Tom. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so next, uh, please give a warm welcome to Mitch Mitchell. Hi everybody, I'm Mitch. Uh, I teach in the print media, print media area of the Studio Arts program. And basically, I really like paper. I like paper a lot because it's cheap, and it's affordable, and it's everywhere, and it's very wasteful. Um, and, um, and we throw it away like crazy, and they just give it to you, you say no, but they just keep on giving it to you. So um, one of the things I like to do is I like to repurpose things. I like to make things to remake things. In this case, uh, using stuff that is, uh, is commonly found is paper, the most engineered material in the world to re-engineer back to a certain sort of substrate. In this case, brass knuckles out of paper, uh, making my grandmother's brass knuckles. Uh, 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 Irish immigrants brought that home, brought that with her to Chicago. Um, but what I'm doing is I like to look at the news, look at the information, and repurposing that. So in this case, using the Metro newspaper, they give those out free every single day, and it's like pure wealth. Um, in the past, I've done a lot of research uh, into what people also can do that is sort of limitless in a way. In this case, making an uh, inflatable uh, hot air balloon. Uh, it actually inflates and deflates by itself. And uh, this, this all comes back to the background that I'm a failed engineer. I'm three credits away from getting my engineering degree. <laughs> Um, and my latest project I've been doing is sort of uh, looking at paper again and sort of, we have all this cutting edge technology, but what can we do with old technology as well? In this case, uh, making wood out of paper, so really compressing paper, thousands upon thousands of sheets, lots of labor, lots of patience, mm -hmm. and then making literally wood. So as you can see here, this is, uh, it looks like wood, thousands of sheets of newspa uh, the metro newspaper that's been condensed to look exactly like pine. And it actually cuts, forms, shapes, controls, glues, everything, everything like maple. It's as hard as maple, but it cuts like paper. 
And from that, I take a lot of my own past experience, that experience being um, growing up as a woodworker, metal worker, um, uh, from uh, uh, Chi-Town, Chicago. And then looking at, see, do we need all this new technology sometimes? Yes, we do. But what can we do with old technology that's super cheap, that you can find on Kijiji? And I've actually been building my own shop doing this. Um, and lately, I actually remade a Louis XVI chair, uh, all out of paper, all by hand. Uh, hand cutting, hand carving. Um, so your body is your own CNC machine, in a sense. So what can you do with that? With just a little bit of patience, knowledge, about a year's worth of uh, newspapers and learning French, reading the Metro every day. Um, and then from that, sort of uh, challenge yourself and challenge the histories, but also knowing the fact that uh, the things I'm interested in remaking are conflicted. And we're at a conflicted time right now because the news is conflicted. That's why I like to use the Metro newspaper or any kind of newspaper that that matter because it's definitely a reflection of today and graphic <coughs> history, graphic information, newspapers, news, information period has a huge history in our lives that hopefully we don't forget. And in this case, much like Louis XVI and being beheaded, there's a reason why. So hopefully, again, we'll have to go through that crap again. Thank you. <laughs> Section 62 to 65. Um, here you, hmm? 
Here you see us, uh, this is in the sense lab. Um, here we actually have pictures from performance. Previous pictures were from uh, development phase. Um, we um, it attempted to infiltrate not just our department with indigenous knowledge, but spaces across campus. Um, we uh, set out to people the public passageways, basements, tunnels, corridors, elevators, staircases, as well as several lobbies and research labs. We wanted to evoke in the audience a feeling for the fact that indigenous presence can and should be felt anywhere across campus. With Concordia as a microcosm that is representing the North American continent, or Turtle Island as a macrocosm. So here you've been in um, the EVS2 down at the bottom, and uh, uh, as you can see, inhabiting the space. Um, the last one. As the Project 12 Dwellings um, deals with space and the related historical and traditional and contemporary issues, the project um, itself interwove questions of colonialism with the specific spatiality of our own campus. For example, what we have found as neglected space, uh, privileged space, public space, um, reserved space, and, um, and, the, and the audience was invited to flow through these varied spaces as they were told the stories of specific indigenous um, experiences. So this experience layered those different meanings. Um, I also lastly wanted to say that the, um, that we use uh, in development the Center for Teaching and Learning, which is specifically laid out to engage with the collaborative learning, which was very useful because we worked in these smaller pods and that place is set up to do that and also that we had a really a great and satisfying relationship with the management of facilities who were super helpful and our students learned a lot in preparing uh, uh, documents to set up uh, at such an event. And that's that. Science, 
Concordia University, if I'm with you and design and computational arts. So these people support us for this crazy idea, plus all these other organizations. And what we did was put together these artists plus scientists, students, all of them students, to create collaborative projects where they were actually using the questions from neuroscience and creating new questions in the arts to analyze these questions and then after that come with an answer to this kind of challenge. So we have three different exhibitions <coughs> that you will see very soon now. So we have 16 different groups and they went together and participate. No, we're fine. They, we have two different exhibitions where we put all these 16 work together that were assisted for more than 1,600 people, where we have the opportunity to talk about science and talk about art with actually the public. So we transplant the idea from science, from art, now to the general public, bringing this initiative together. So what you see here are some of the pieces of art that the collaboration <coughs> will create together. Now, we are very interested in, sorry, yes, to learn from this initiative. So we recreate again the course for this year, and we are teaching it together with Regina Foget, who is in the Department of Education. We are teaching neuroscience to our students. We are teaching them to give short talks about science and art, to debate and have questions, and to learn about their artistic process. So this is a little bit what they do. They go to studios, they go to labs, they share experiences, they visit museums, they see contemporary galleries, and also scientific conferences. The idea with all this in the original was faster. Sorry for that. So the idea with all these is actually challenge concept between science and art, make them question each other. What we want with the course, our objectives, our study, is create creative thinking in neuroscientists and critical thinking in artists so they can share this knowledge together without one teaching to each other. We want to also take them out of the comfort zone, so this is a way that can discuss, because right now arts are in their own group talking between them, and scientists are in their own group talking to themselves and not talking to each other and not talking to anyone else. We want also that they understand that the point of views can be seen from different perspectives and you can talk about them. With that, what we want to destroy stereotypes between science and artists and bring this destruction of stereotypes to people outside and share with the public. So this is all what I have to say and we can talk more later. <laughs> grab a glass of water or a snack, um, and we're just going to, if you guys want to turn yourselves a little bit, we're going to start our discussion. Please, please, yes. So, Space you wish you had. Uh, Space you wish you had. Yeah, that's, that's something actually I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, we are seeing, like, I work, in, I work in convergence with other colleagues. Uh, we are not a one-man team, we are actually a team. So we have people in art education, we have people in science education, we have people in education, different, different people. And what we see is even uh, since this idea is kind of new, we have just like a 30 century years, but this is relatively new for how difficult to move science and other stuff is like a big dynasty. We see that the spaces are required and we need like fine grants are seen that we can apply for bringing these things together, two of them. So we have a spaces where we have new science happening, we have spaces where the art is happening, but we don't have spaces where we can actually put them together and have like a solid base where we can not be worried about what comes next. So we can develop uh, a project substantially. So that would be my first point. Thank you. Yeah. How else does people do people think about uh, collaborative spaces and how we can make that happen? Um, maybe 
if there was like a focus point. Um, so it's not just you walk in and you're supposed to talk to someone. Specifically, like, um, I'm in computer science, and one of the biggest issues I have with making friends is people are terrible at socializing. And this is not a joke. This is absolutely true. And so usually what I do to start conversation with like my, my fellow classmates is I right away start by what games do you play? Or something along the lines of how do you like this class? It's always oriented. There's no like, hey, what's up? My name is Rachel. It's more like you, you bring up a subject and then you let them respond and then you build off of it. So letting people just sit around and try to build conversation, at least in like my field, not gonna happen. You have to have a focus point, you have to say, okay, this is what we're talking about. Um, what do you guys think? So let's build on that. <laughs> is there something you can think of, like maybe a way that a space is oriented or something that exists in that space that might help foster that first conversation that you're talking about? Um, like, is it like a game table? Where people well, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, but, but it has to be something that's like easy to talk about. So like, um, a, like a cultural reference that's easy to grasp. So something more along the lines of a movie that just came out. Right? Every, like you don't you don't have to be a specific person to go watch a movie, um, or maybe something that has like inter something that also involves art but also involves science. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys know these artists called Nonotrack. They work with light pictures and they make art with light. So How do you spell that? N O N O T A K. They make art with light pictures and they have these interactive art exhibits where you just walk in and it's just a bunch of lights. And what makes that interesting for me is because that involves programming, that involves a lot of work in the background to try to get those lights to function and look natural or do exactly what you want. And then it also involves there's a physical aspect to it. So someone has to build it. So there's your engineering, like how did they get those pipings or the lights to move in that way? And then the art part is the creativity. Right. That is fantastic. Where's Paula? Oh, hey. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I really have no idea um, how how we would go about discussing these things, um, but I think it's important to bring it up now because this is almost exactly what we're talking about. Um, so Paula is in my cohort. That's my program director, Leo, uh, from the aforementioned graduate certificate program, uh, and one of our current projects is creating a system that will prepare students uh, upon graduation for the job market and doing so specifically by creating those kinds of situations. So having it be project based or company based, coming in and having this diversification and this collaboration between students from all different areas. Yeah. Oh, I got excited and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that would orient for better meeting and collaboration. Um, and with this, in, in just in my personal experience with the scientists I've collaborated with or have brought into the group, it's all started out super casually and maybe over lunch or something for another reason and then someone says something kind of interesting that you're still thinking about two weeks later and then you meet for coffee again. Or like it, I, I think as comfortable and as informal, like it could simply be a place that people wanted to and eat their lunch, that would probably work pretty well with the fridge and microwave. Like, it has to be that. <laughs> and in terms of space and um, it, it's, it's really just space with a very reasonable logistics around it for using it, access, uh, getting materials in and out easily. Um, yeah, that's a huge one for Yeah. So, um, talking about what you mentioned, uh, water in sex on is picking one book that you wrote as community that one of the big things that trigger actually the innovation for the digital era that we're using today was Bell Labs having actually engineering one part and kind of other departments and they were just crossing in the launch areas or areas where it was just common, not necessarily in the same department. Like what you guys have here is the AD building. You have engineering on one side and art on the other. Now what I noticed Still having engineering one side and our other, you don't have the mismatch. What we do 
try to get them in mass, is to create events where people can. And we do two kinds of things. One, we do alcohol and cheese. So people can and have a distribution of the cortex and they talk because they feel more confident to talk. Or we can have just food. And the other thing that we do also is we prepare little games, introductory games. So we made this in a very friendly way and even and we have one of these events yesterday and we have scientists, like audio scientists, who they usually don't talk too much to people that they don't know, and all of them were talking at the end and sharing what they're doing. So maybe include some spaces that are common with some kind of activity that happens once in a while that offers something to them who help to trigger this conversation. I'm not sure if you can tell, uh, I'm probably not the best person for a whiteboard, being left-handed. <laughs> but that is okay. I think that's a, a great... Oh, yes, please. One thing um, I noticed when we were starting to introduce the sign shop into the archive was that we, we uh, it really helped to go to each other's spaces. So we sent our students into a chemistry lab at a SAGE app to introduce these art materials to the SAGE app students as they were uh, discovering sort of the chemical uh, processes that happen on Mars, for example, and then they would use uh, the materials that the chemistry teacher thought would be helpful. And so, but we watched how uncomfortable we were, like in those spaces, and then when the, chemi when the chemistry teachers came to our archive, it was like, well, there's no wall space. Where am I going to do my PowerPoint? And, you know, they were really disoriented. And I think that that type of disorientation is really healthy. Yeah. And, and experiencing that type of discomfort is what we all need to just know this is a norm. We should be uncomfortable because we're crossing over these really big divides. Yeah. And let that be a part of it. And not try to over-program that, but just to, to experience that. Douglas gave a really great presentation on building those spaces to accommodate that. Um, so this parent teacher interview. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about meetings. Import. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but a place that could really encompass not only research creation, specifically for artists <coughs> and sculptors. Um, <laughs> Uh, but a place where we could actually bring those people to have those collaborations, um, where we could fit in to do any any number of those things. I think that would be really ideal. I, I don't need to call out Switak and Prem, but maybe you two could talk about one of the strategies in, for the design of force space was actually proposing wild scenarios, like to say that the, you know we want to. <laughs> Change car oil in the morning, have yeah. a circus performer by night, and then burn sweet grass the next afternoon. Right? Yeah, so like we could talk about that we, when, um, I mean, I came onto the project originally and was sort of consultant, uh, and uh, I'm not letting you introduce yourself, but in that sort of scenario, and I come from a fine arts background as well. Uh, Kind of working in interdisciplinary projects, but also I've started up a couple of different types of institutions, and, um, as well as event-based art type things. Um, and what what one of the kind of approaches of our sort of development team was to to like I guess push as far as we could with the space because uh, we knew it would only get to a certain. So we said, okay, we want to be able to like cook a hot dog on a jet engine. We want to be able to burn sweet grass. We want to be able to allow people to come in and maybe tan hides. We want to, you know, do uh, scientific demonstrations with compressed gas. We want to. So we kind of came up with uh, that sort of insane OCD grid that Doug had showed was our use case scenarios. And then um, 
because we're serving all four faculties and also uh, one of the things we noticed was a lot of synchronicity between the faculties but also a lot of silos um, between different groups and uh, people like trying to kind of get in contact with each other. So while we were doing a kind of uh, research phase, which actually Rebecca sort of initiated, um, touring those different spaces, we were really sort of looking to create a kind of, yeah, multi-tool or a space that would be here to, um, to facilitate synchronicities between those groups. And, you know, originally we had a sort of lab space, and, you know, they took away the wall, but we kept the drains, we kept the hookups, we kept, you know, so we sort of tried to, we wouldn't normally have a drain in an art gallery, for example, um, but, you know, we have aquaponics, and we put the drain in, people would come and use the drain, you know. <laughs> so I guess that's, in a way, we sort of went on a foray and pushed as far as we could. Uh, one of the things in the space is this sort of um, uh, nano wall, which is behind the screen there, which is still kind of actually being constructed, but uh, it's intended so that in the warm months, it's, it'll be a glass open wall, so the space will be able to open up kind of like a garage in the summer um, and have this sort of porosity to the street, which is also something that uh, is useful for engineering and student groups, but could be used by anybody. I don't know if that adds some sort of Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I was thinking about it for, for two reasons. One is that it's actually a kind of method and a, a kind of system to use to, to, to push oneself to think about things that you can't even yet imagine <laughs> and to almost prepare for the unimaginable as best as one can in terms of outfitting a space, but I think it's also, um, it just, it brings things back to a very, uh, very physical level at the same time you're talking about conceptual potentials. Um, so it's, it could be an interesting method for us to use as we think about the next decade of research creation. I mean, we don't, we don't, we don't even know some of the things that could start to happen. So how do we, how do we prepare spaces for the unknown? And how do we connect to spaces that we can't go to? Um, right, and another. connect to things that we can't bring in. So one of the things that we found out through the process was uh, there's things that happen in labs and different spaces that are specialized spaces that can't come here um, because they might make us ill, if we you know, or for whatever sort of reason. So part of our strategy, I suppose, was to be able to accommodate those things well, so there might be times where we can't, you know, show the balloon being shot by the two lasers and it only, the inside balloon blows up if the red laser is on or whatever, but we could have a video of that and then a sort of example of a prototype and somebody could sort of explain what that research is and what they're doing, so there's that as well, that you can't always bring stuff from specialized spaces and put it in an actual space, but you can visualize it. That's, that's actually a very interesting thing. Um, we have some spaces that are, as you mentioned, like very specialized, like, that we cannot bring that here. But I find really cool that we can, like, kind of partnership with you guys, go there and there, do something in respond to what you see over there, we create something here in, in, in a new position. That's, that's very cool. I was interested in Mitch and Drew. I don't know if he's still here. I'm going to say the repeat together. But that sort of reusing of materials to create materials. And I wonder if maybe because Jewel left <laughs> speaking too, because you had to make your own space to do that. And maybe you could tell us a bit about how we could use space here to do things like that, like making woodblock out of paper. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's um, a lot of my research now. I, mean, I know I, I figured out how to. So I'm patenting the patenting the material, and I figured that out. But one thing, one of the biggest constraints that I had in doing so was just the limitation of space and or access to machinery and tools. And but that kind of made it really interesting for me. That's sort of the fact that I didn't have this or that or the 
high-end stuff or, or this machine, period. So it made me really think about actually making my own machines. And that became sort of like a sculptural, formative uh, engineering aesthetic that I think my, like my partner, she looks at it, she's just like, this is a modernist sculpture on crack. <laughs> but that becomes really interesting because then it gets her mind going and, and uh, we share studios together. And I think that was something that really engaged me, and still is, um, in the sense that we have, as, as, a, as a working space, um, um, all of our working spaces are behind closed walls. And a lot of times we wonder what's going on. And it's not really interesting to a degree. The, the, the whimsy, the, the wonder is interesting. But then it's all, it's, it's this sort of closed in, sort of um, claustrophobic space for students, even faculty sometimes. Sometimes really, we know it's there, it's in our own building, but we can't have access to it. Or it's a, it's a, it's a visual conundrum. And um, I think for me, and just sort of working on this project, it's been really exciting to um, have the opportunity to, in a sense, as my brain goes there, making the equipment, but then also just having an audience there looking at it every day and seeing, like, and basically, I mean, finding new introductions and new interactions. Um, and that becomes, I think, just because there's no wall. Mm -hmm. and it becomes so, yeah, of course, there's safety help and all stuff. Uh, but like, like even glass walls, or something that people can actually look at and see what's going on and sort of experiment with their own brain, that can be the first introduction to, you know, someone who's afraid of a table set or afraid of a drawing class because they can't draw, quote unquote, you know, or whatever, or afraid of math, you know, and then how that can be used in someone. Um, and I've been really been thinking about that a lot of just um, what are the what are the barriers between things and for me this project was I don't have the equipment I, on on access I had to change studios on the quickly but then I realized well it's an opportunity to actually re-engage my my entire uh, yeah, metro system and literally the only excuse I have is myself and that was uh, I'm still working that out which is exciting. It's interesting about visibility. A couple of years ago, we did this embedded faculty initiative where arts and you know, art faculty and science uh, faculty met. Uh, actually, Peter Fleming went around and documented like I had a hard drive full of photos of various pieces of equipment around labs. But I mean, if you walk through the basement of the EV, you'd never know what's actually stored there, and then you open a door and you're like, oh my god, this recreates the sun. Oh my god, it has a robot here, you know? Like, and the, each, each lab has these amazing facilities, with giant wind tunnels, with all this kind of thing. Things that just vibrate, like that's the whole job. That's every Anyway, and, uh, but it was really interesting tagging along to see just the opportunities where, you know, faculty interact with me, and there were, I don't know what people, like how many things came out, but definitely some relationship with one that oh, if you ever need to grind the lens, you can go up to Professor X's lab. And, you know, he was like, sure, come on, like just drop me a line or whatever. So there are abilities for those kind of encounters, but there's a walls of visibility and just walls, disciplinary walls. I think that you know the nature of the way engineers work versus the way artists work. Yeah. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I agree. That you was, were, yeah. Like, uh, that kind of came at the tail end. I did my master's degree here. Maybe I'm still here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was one of the most kind of inspiring things in that time or engaging with this institution for me was those tours. And I thought, oh, like, imagine if fine arts just had these tours available that like master's students could go through and see this stuff because not, I mean, not everybody will want that, but the people who are interested in those kind of synchronicities, it's always a thing of trying to get to it. And you know, I've been in that basement sort of looking through the windows <laughs> like, what is that thing? Like, <laughs> and then getting those tours and seeing all of that sort of type, those different forms of machines, materials, like inquiries, 
knowledge, just that stuff is super cool. I'm wondering about like buildings in the future that have a balance between transparency but also spaces to be by yourself. artists have studios or not have studios? Should everything be open and shared? Or do we need our, our little hiding holes to go into? And I like shared space, but I also like my hiding hole. And he, he <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> too. <laughs> hiding hole. And they had described going to Emily Carr, where she just had this beautiful new building, and they were aghast because the students had made all these blanket boards. So they could each have, like, <laughs> so they could have their own studio space, which I totally get. And I think there's something, I mean, I, I know it's President Art making, and I suspect it's President Science doing science where you, you have a bunch of false starts that you don't want to perform live in front of everybody. Like you just gotta, you gotta make a mess by yourself. And then once you start to feel it, then okay, now we can talk. But yeah, that's kind of like one of the learning things. But, those of not knowing. but it's also the access. Like, like I, my, I think if I, if I made my students uh, do everything live in front of me, they quit the class. Like they, they just need a little time to get their act, to get a thought together before they down a blanket. Yes, you've got the first thought. Right. Right. Yeah. Here's the performativity of even open space can be a deterrent for some people. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. Or, and just giving just to recognize different needs. Mm -hmm. To have that that menu of possibilities always available so that you can make the choices. Do I want my high duel today or do I want to be out in the, in the cafe, you know, hanging out with, with people I don't even know. And I think that's something that right now we have very tightly contrived typologies of spaces. It's kind of like it's either or instead of both and. Yeah. Um, you know, I was really struck just how many times the idea of sort of casualness has come up. Um, and, you know, I think part of the, these exercises are, are to also think um, along the both and. And, you know, one of the, I guess, one thing that I'm thinking about around recuperative spaces and particularly I'm pointing to jazz uh, here because um, Anna Timbalkas and with other colleagues, many of you know, have, has formed Sucker, which is the uh, Concordia Creative Center for Center for Creative Reuse, um, and is now recuperating, you know, just kilos and kilos of material from the whole university, um, bringing it into a central site, and then um, anybody from the, the Concordia public and I think the website public mm -hmm. can they come <laughs> and and take these materials for free, and you just you weigh your stuff on the way out so that they can. Uh, calculate how much is being diverted from landfill and it's actually being reused. So, I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to imagine some kind of uh, open space that would be like a recuper recuperable lab and people would just could bring recuperable um, objects. There might be a place to, to invent or create machines to, to compress these plastics or to, um, you know, cut this paper that's been conjoined. And then there might be, you know, a cafe next to that and then and then 10 hidey holes right off to the edge. And, you know, like, I think part of it is, is thinking about not just synchronicities, but, but even about choreographies of, of, um, of dirty and clean, or social and private, um, uh, unprogrammed and, and, and highly constricted, and allowing those to actually have adjacencies with, with each other that, that they don't right now. So I think research creation in particular, well, no, I shouldn't, I, it, it all does. Research creation, STEAM, and experimental pedagogy, that's been a recurring theme in all three of the idea labs so far, so far is how um, there are th this, there's this necessity for these different typologies of space that are not just in the divisions that we tend to make, which is curricular, like is this a classroom research, is this a lab, um, uh, uh, what do we say? Um, free flowing. Is this a staircase? And so I think part of it is to cut across those typical ways that we imagine space and to think about their reutilization rather than their categorization. So it's been really helpful just hearing everybody's uh, thoughts based on their own work. There's one thing I'd like to add to this, which is actually about um, 
ties into the sustainability, but it's actually the sustainability of practice. So Mitch's work couldn't be done unless he had, you know, it was a one year or two year project. So you have to have things that can go for longer too. And that's a really big issue for students too. So the idea of changeable spaces is all very well, but we also need places that work can develop over a whole year. Yeah. Yeah. I think that he, uh, not even working in university, just working, just working period, there's, there's, there's always an ebb and flow, but it seems like our timelines are just constantly being constricted, and yeah. whether it be like life, job, or life, you know, it's something that is like we were, it seems like there's been a, a, a sense of a need for reduction of so much when in reality we just need more sort of mental space, physical space, uh, time space, just to consider something and sort of react to it. It's like you have your high people go away from it, sort of think about it on your own terms and then before you destroy it, but then also before you destroy it in the public, for them to destroy it and then react from there. And I think time is a really important sort of factor that uh, is never really talked about too much in regards to space. The bookable model works very well for some for digital practices, yeah. but it doesn't work for all practices. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm just thinking of animation. Yeah. You know, looking at Celia, because that, that was a discussion that we had around the animation spaces and yes. different temporalities that are needed there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reality is also that I mean, it's good to have that community place where people actually can go. But in animation, for example, we really spend a lot of time in a dark room under a camera <laughs> where you just need to stay there by yourself. Otherwise, you just can't work again. So the, it's not possible for us to have like an open space like where everybody looks like you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I wanted to say something, but I'm not really sure this is at the right avenue. I know that a lot of the conversations that, that I'm having on the of the engineering department is about um, taking a lot of courses online and taking more digital. So I, so I heard the comment about digital, so I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't make my comment. But, uh, well, I think everything that's being said here is very, very exciting and very inspiring for me as well to be able to take back to the engineering classes and these are the kind of conversations we need to have, so thank you. But I also want to see as well, as we're having those conversations of how do you take these classes online or how do you have these dialogues online, how do we ensure all of these areas and all of these things that we're talking about, collaboration and parts, collaboration with different departments are also important as well. And I think it's important yeah, to throw that out collaborative in the, in the virtual realm exactly. as well as but I see that's where a lot of the educational trends are going, is how do you make things more virtual, how do you give people, so it's not just the university and traditional university space, but rather a more open, a more open definition of what the university looks like. And in that case, and what would those virtual spaces look like? Yeah, yeah that's really neat, just because each faculty has its own uh, IT section that manages server space, or like what, yeah. like, yeah. there are these kind of <laughs> silos apart from each other, for specific projects, like that's a form of space too. It could be like mm -hmm. very very mm -hmm. Wow, so, yeah. <laughs> that's the Christian. Sorry, what was your name? Rachel. 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 Yeah. It's all right. Um, you can go first. Okay. So, um, in respect to what you were saying, guys, about how the the curriculum kind of constrains maybe the, the ideas and the way that, that we do things. Um, what we are doing is using what we have right now to put these people together, but one of the things that will be very interesting for us is actually have spaces where we can do kind of residencies, where we can actually put people from the arts, people from the science, to work in this kind of new lab where they can work in this kind of in this Spaces that can be a pool or an open space, all depend on the project. But but for that, for sure, that residential space needs also like to have the links to the places where they will be collaborating, right? If you want to do a collaboration, you will need these two groups sort of use this common space. One of the problems that you will find always, at least in your science, is what you were saying before, like you cannot just go there and do whatever you want because the equipment costs four houses while you're buying a floor. And, and the owner of the equipment will not want to give you access to that if, if you're not sure that would be safe. So it, 
what is necessary a place that is safe for both uh, groups to actually use and play and, and do things. Uh, this, this kind of like, as I say, internships or, uh, or residency that are not just a couple of weeks for for do a, I, I think a good research, a good creation process, you need like longer spaces of time. You're online. Um, yeah, so at least what currently you're doing is I look, I'm taking the EGR 215, it's a math class, and there's a Facebook group, and there's a Facebook group, and it's just, the Facebook group is called Fall and the Name of the Course 2018. And every time one of us has a question, or like, I think over 100 students, they post it on the group, and at least two people respond. The thing is about specifically like Cordia, Cordia Online, it's honestly terrible. And no one likes working on, no one likes going on eConcordia, no one likes going on MyConcordia. Everyone thinks the websites are really poorly made. <laughs> and because of it, even if you, if you were to make these online courses and you want to create an online community, you would need way better um, <laughs> of environment online because all it's going to do is you're going to be, oh cool, there's a comment section. No one's going to use it because this website's too shoddy and it's not reliable. So we're just going to go back to Facebook, back to Reddit, yeah. and like work on these third party things, which also is a little bit more comfortable for most students because if you're on a Concordia website and you're complaining about a course, you're going to be like, I don't really want to complain on this thing, and I'd rather go complain on Facebook. Right. Yeah. No, it's interesting because you never, I think that's a huge challenge for universities because our IT departments and our like design web teams will never ever be able to compete with of the not. functionality of, yeah. of those platforms, right? Yeah. So it, it's like how do you, maybe, what do you do with the space you have as a big hit? Maybe encourage the use of those platforms actually and say, hey, this is our Facebook group, come join, a, come join the conversation on the Facebook group. Yeah. And just like accept the fact that that community will always belong to that website, and developing or creating that community on a, on your own own like homegrown website may not be possible. And I think that might be easier just to say like here are the communities for your courses. Um, if you have any questions, it's all just students. Just go for it. Is maybe that would work? And yeah, it's very interesting. Everyone is engaged like that. It works. <laughs> or, or Reddit or Slack even. I mean, Slack is Slack control. Because, like, let's be honest, no one's going to be like talking to their mom through Slack. Yeah. So, like, it might work better. <laughs> I think the issue when it comes to that, though, is why well, clearly we most students are using those platforms. Yeah. There's also the protection of students and content. Yeah. And who has control over that? Okay. So we're looking at Facebook and Reddit has control over whatever the content is and we're monitoring. And as a university, as excuse my language, as shitty as the, the platforms are that we have available to us, and unfortunately, the reason why we push through with them is because we control them. And you can want to protect students and protect the kind of comments that are being done on, we have control, and, and then as well, you don't have to worry about a third party only if you're using that content for anything else. That being said, I don't disagree with you. It is, I mean, these are billion dollar companies that are creating these platforms, and it's hard to compete with there is that I don't have an answer for this to say as well. There, there are different elements we have to take into account as yeah. to how, how students are protected as well. Two thoughts about that real quick because I'm so interested in that idea and um, in the DigiFab, just for ships, we use a, a Facebook to like switch ships. You know, it's the easiest way to contact your phone. So fast. But um, my kid brother, who's like 12 years younger than me, does not have an account, right? He's a student of the and I'm like, get Facebook so I can message you. He's like, no one has Facebook. We all use like Instagram and Twitter. So thinking too about like, what is the technology that is going to be used, and how can we? Maybe it needs to be an app, something easy like that. I think Facebook is like really great at the moment. Um, maybe like something like, because you know, I don't know if you guys know what it is, but WebWorks is this like math assignment thing that comes with a lot of math classes. Don't have a choice to use it. It's created by oh, yeah. Stanford. Okay, like we, yeah. we did develop it, and we use it for our math classes. So maybe if there was a Facebook equivalent for universities, all universities, 
that they can use and say like anything that is on this website is protected via the like it's a big if and it's like you have to find I don't know a team that's okay with like open sourcing everything and being okay with this type of environment, but yeah. something like like something like what works except for communication. I think it's just a weird legal space. I mean, I work in the communications area here as, a, as staff, but I've looked into different, I mean, I think this is why everybody just goes off book and does things yeah. on Facebook, because there's a lot of legal limitations of storing data um, okay. in the cloud, and then also with, uh, especially student information on the cloud, that's probably stored in the United States itself. So yeah. then, it's transnational, it's just like, there's reasons why I just go, you know what, I'm just going to quietly form this over here and do it because, you know, but I wasn't really thinking about it as uh, like a, a method of communicating with new people. I was thinking of like a project space, like like in tag, if, I don't, where do they build their games, you know what I mean? Like where is it being hosted or something? Like is it, are they using space that's been allotted on our servers and then it's able to connect? People can make projects together in that space, or you know what I mean. I don't yeah, know. Like, I, don't I mean, like GitHub is really common and popular, yeah. but I let's not like get too much into this because I feel like. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other aspect of like physical locations, um, at least for like someone like myself, like I'm part of a research project. I do not want people staring at me while I work on this stuff because it's uncomfortable. I feel like I'm always being watched, which you are. And it's just like, it's hard to just like, do your own thing, feel comfortable in your environment if you're constantly being stared at. Yeah. And like, although sure, it probably looks super cool from an exterior perspective, I don't feel like stopping my work every 15 minutes to explain it. I'd rather just continue going on, and then like once once a year have a presentation to be like, this is what I'm doing, have a nice day. I was thinking about uh, this idea of the, the basement of like, all these different things that we have access, or we could have access to, but don't see, and even the fact that maybe you don't want on a personal level to show, but but people want to see what's going on, and maybe this idea of like an interactive map in the casual space where people eat lunch and talk to each other, and the map can just show the different things that are happening in the school, like really visual, like not so heavy, like you know, with text of like an this is this, but really just showing like this is something that's happening here and this is happening there. And people can go up to it while they're having their lunch and just sort of interact with seeing what's possible. Yeah, and then like maybe having like a meeting treat once every week or like a time when you know a schedule is put on for your own active club or own machinery. You say you can come in between on Thursdays and between two to four. And uh, someone will be there if you want to talk to us, talk to us. If no one shows up, you can continue doing your work. Yeah. And it's not too invasive, and you won't feel that kind of pressure to be like always available to the public. I don't know. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's a model that I really respond to in regards to that. It's not like mentioned earlier with the live space and so on. But then, like, uh, I was found a couple years ago, I was at a residency in uh, Belgium. It's a, uh, a place called Casper. It's called Friends of the Real Centrum. And it's a, it's a building that looks like a spaceship. It literally looks like a spaceship, but it's a giant print facility. And around it are located all these A-frame houses, the studio spaces. So what's wonderful is that like, in, like, it's open basically for 12 hours a day, it's in the spaceship. And you can basically just, it's just packed all kinds of good, old, new, digital, everything. And what's great is you have the opportunity to go in whenever you want to work on something and, and do your thing, so then you can take your stuff at your leisure to your own sort of private Studio mm -hmm. and so on, and, uh, and it's actually based off of, uh, an original. Um, it originally was based off a of design by Frank Lloyd Wright way back in the day, um, and it's an old model. This I don't think it's utilized enough to the degree. Um, the fact that there is that, like, we kind of use it now in maker spaces that are kind of growing, that, like an expanded space where everybody has access to, and there's technicians and assistants and so on. But there's that sort of model of like. Okay, I've done it. Go, I can go here and sort of be in my own yeah. you know, world. But then I can like, okay, I can go back there. And there's that sort of freedom to do that. Um, there, there's a there's a very neat system, and I and I found that to be really exciting. Is that you can go and be at your leisure. What would be the scale of that? Uh, how big? How big is Friends Miles Real? 
it's big. It's, like, it's really on the it's on a, it's on a, on a farming area, and it's a, it's a government uh, uh, funded space. It's Belgium, so they throw tons of money into cars and so on. It's probably about a total of the acreage is. Well, I mean, I mean, in terms of how many people are working around. Oh, the there's uh, last time I was there, there were 25 people. Which, uh, what's it called? Franz Monserrat. It's like two words, Franz. That's a real M E S. Wait, hold on. Bronze. What is it? Yeah. And that is M E S E R E E L. And then Centrum. C E N T R U M. What was the residency that you were on last summer? What was that like in terms of? I mean, you were working with technicians day in day out. Did, did you then have a separate studio at night? Really I didn't have access, I only had working hours, yeah. and because it was such high-end equipment, yeah. so it, it was the um, Tilburg Textile Lab and Museum, so again, it's, uh, it's, it's with the Netherlands put a lot of money into kind of arts and cultural events, and this one was really about a production, it was a production residency to use industrial equipment that our artists or designers don't normally, it's the only way to get access to that kind of equipment. So it's a very different, so it's really targeted for production rather than creative thinking. Right. But, yeah. you, but creative practitioners are slotted in at a certain point in the year? That yeah, they're well, just you, have to, you have to write proposals to get a space and you're, you're, you get time booked based on what your proposal consists of and you pay a lot of money okay. to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of got a question. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was in the area like a lot, I was in the teaching math, and, and I, I listened there a lot of ideas also to construct something, like, and biggest structures and all that, which cost tons of money that I don't know if Concordia has or if you guys have grants or something like that. Like, you actually have already a lot of natural spaces, and and not just, like, for example, this is awesome. And in, in fine arts, it's awesome spaces. And I know engineers have awesome spaces. So what kind of scenes do you see that actually we could do all together to actually communicate these spaces that already exist? Instead to create something like a huge farm, instead that are really amazing, <laughs> would be awesome to that. But it's not going to happen in five, 20 years, 20 years. Yeah. Like, what do we do with your stuff yeah. now? Yeah. Or yeah. with other or, or spaces like, I mean, I come from the MHT and they offer spaces to you guys visit. And we do events and we bring people there. So like, what we can do all together to use the spaces that already exist. I, I see that, that I'm, I'm really, that's what I'm interested to see here. So it, what I, I, well, I think the factor that why, sorry, just to follow up on that, the reason why you actually pay to kind of access these things is it actually funds the sustainability of that as a resource because then I have highly qualified individuals I could work with. And you know, I think that that's part of what how do we fund the people who can actually help the technical and support um, environment so we can have more of them to, to you like, know like for example could could we like use part of the money that we all receive to give part of the money for time for the technician or the scientists or the artists to dedicate like maybe one day or half a day for do this kind of collaboration? Mm -hmm. can, can that create actually a space that people can use to, to share or create ideas together? My sense is spaces also need to be maintained and that's one of the realities that we have to kind of, like nobody wants to go into a you know, we have open painting studios and they become really problematic because nobody's responsible. Yeah. Yeah. So they become, you know, it's a give and take situation which I think is really great, needs creative thinking about. Yeah. Um, I have an idea about that, but um, let's just, oh, okay. Um, well, with like computer science and software engineering, we have these things called hackathons and what they are is like, just a bunch of people get together and they get they are given a task and everyone has to work to work with the team to solve the task. Well, maybe we can do one like I know GMSB is trying to start one called Calm uh, EMGR or something, and it's a hackathon involving business students and they're trying to get in the you have to make a team of two um, uh, ECA students and two GMSB students 
and maybe you guys can make, I don't know, a cross-platform hackathon, so one that takes a weekend, and you say you need to make a, a functioning art uh, piece. Um, here, but obviously that implies if you're going to do with art, you need physical objects, and not just a computer like every student has. So, but you say like, here are your, you have to get sponsors, here are a bunch of art, art stuff, here's some wires and some small Arduinos, program a movie something, or like, I don't know if you guys saw like Intel sponsors and artists do some like really cool track art, and they did one where it's like a breathing wall, and the wall is like grass, and it just looks like it breathes. Um, maybe a cloth across a uh, faculty hackathon, in a way. Something that's suitable in like a weekend, and there's a prize at the end. I like it. I do it. <laughs> um, to, to bring it back a little bit um, in terms of maintaining the spaces, we've done an incredible amount of research um, in terms of the, uh, the fabrication spaces. And then uh, of my own, for uh, some of the things we've been doing in our program, uh, looking at maker spaces uh, and the structure that they employ, working from the ground up in terms of having students volunteer and feel empowered and Brianna has magically taken that on in terms of the uh, Sapphire's project. So that's great implementation when students come, then they feel comfortable being trained to use the machines, and then they're able to work their way up to train other students. So it distributes the responsibilities, uh, provides delegation, um, and I think creates a sense of community where people are actually engaging and it's not a, a terrible mess. Um, oh, and to follow up, uh, I think you made a lot of really great points. Um, two things that I had in mind. I want to know um, from Swintech, how did this space actually happen? Um, and then, so I don't forget, uh, how can we communicate further? Because we have all these great ideas. I actually have a lot of really good resources if you want to look at the spaces um, that are scalable. I know a lot of companies that actually offer free consultations um, for creating these free platform spaces. Um, so I don't know if. Well, just to say at the end before you all leave, if I can get your emails um, so that I can continue communication about this and, and you can take mine. So if you have any other suggestions that come maybe a week after, oh, this would have been a great idea, like feel free to send that to me later and let us see. Um, but we'll do an email exchange. Maybe I can, we'll get a piece of, Rita will have a piece of paper and you'll be able to sign an email. Even if you have to leave early, maybe you can go to her we'll be able to communicate now. Yeah, yeah. that would be perfect. Um, I think what we're really seeing is uh, a lot of these conversations are percolating in all these different areas, and then we've touched upon that. Uh, but again, it's within these isolated areas. And once we build these discussions and we, these ideas, how do we carry them forward to be like, hey, engineering, what's up? Let's, let's figure this out and actually create an actionable plan. Um, how, did this, how did this happen? <laughs> um, well, I used to have lots of different phases in it. I think maybe Rebecca might be able to speak better than I for the very early uh, Richerettes because I came in sort of after there had already been uh, some work done. Maybe do you want to start about the very, very beginning and then I can pass that? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll try to compress a few brief things. About three and a half years ago, the uh, fine arts along with all the other faculties was asked to come up with a, strategic, a set of strategic directions for, for the faculty at the same time the university was coming up with its own. And some of you who are around might remember that um, fine arts through idea labs and other PhD pop-up lounges and, and teas with the undergrads and various consultations, we actually came up with a series of what we call strategic speculations. Um, and many of these were actually quite out I won't say outlandish, but they were provocative. We, we knew that some of them wouldn't actually take place. Um, one of them that that was suggested was what we nicknamed Praxis Portals. And the provocation was that we would take over all the retail spaces on St. Catherine in the EV building, and that we would turn them into uh, an open fab lab for the public, um, a rehearsal space that was um, uh, you know, used for our students and, and members of the public if they wanted to join us, and that we would also have like a kind of art vault where you could come in and talk to practitioners about how art was actually made. Um, of course, that that couldn't happen, but it, it obviously triggered some idea in the upper administration because 
18 months later, we were contacted and they said, listen, you know that kind of whacked out idea that you had on St. Catherine? Well, it turns out that the library space is coming open, the bookstore is moving downstairs. Do you think that you could help us think of something that would be university-wide? Um, and we said, sure, we'd love, we'd love to help you do that. And so we held um, a, a big charrette. It was about two and a half, three hours. We had people from all over the university. Uh, and this, the problem we set ourselves is, what do we want to do with this space? Everybody has an hour. Go figure it out. And then we came back together and we pulled a whole series of ideas. Um, and then that was a trigger that led to a number of other conversations. And we started um, sort of taking an idea that, that fine arts has often struggled with, which is how, how does one engage in process? Or how do you show process? Or how do you articulate process? Um, because in, in our fields, oftentimes the outcomes are very, um, it's the product. You see the play. You see the performance. You see the exhibition. But really, what we do is like 99% is around making <laughs> and thinking and, you know. So the question was translated as, how do we show research, which is also just as complicated. It's processual. It's, it's dynamic. It's durational. It's full of failure and success. So in a way, it's like research is a kind of giant art project in our minds. So that's what triggered the conversation about this space. And then that, that moved into what Swintak was talking about in terms of how do you outfit a space um, that can show process and invite people into process. Um, but it was a university initiative, so that means, um, in very practical sense, that it, that it was at the presidential level, um, and at the Office of Research level, and the provost level. So it was also the first time that I heard where um, all the faculties and three major um, upper level offices came together collectively around a single idea. Um, so it was a very, it's an unusual situation, but I think this is why everybody's eyes are on course space, because it's modeling a lot of work that we want to think about for the future. Um, and two other, I think there were other, other inspirations that came from fine arts that have been mentioned today. So we, um, we worked on a project called Foyer, which is, some of you know, is the physical space of Foyer, and there were some seed grants that would allow students from any of the um, programs uh, in graduate degrees to actually come and meet casually with one another and actually form research teams uh, to, to work on projects that we, where we, didn't, we had no interest in the outcome. It could not be connected to your own PhD research or research for another professor. It had to be totally experimental and it was really up to you. It was very open-ended. But it was just a way to try to casually introduce people to one another. And then we also had the Embedded Faculty Initiative, which um, started out with a, a number of, of intensive tours where we, um, it was based on the kind of idea of hospitality. We just invited each other into one another's spaces. So we traveled through, I think, at least um, 18 different laboratories across the whole university just to see what one another was doing. And the, the idea was that in those, in those tours, um, conversations would happen so that faculty members could literally embed themselves into another faculty member's lab in a very casual way. It wasn't about shared research. It wasn't, didn't need to be about um, you know, co-teaching. It was really about a kind of um, uh, hospitality exchange. So you know, in some ways, I feel like there were a number of, 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 of forays, but I also have to admit that, that none of them really stuck. Um, but I think that's, that's OK. I mean, these are part of the conversations that we're trying to have with each other to, to make these, these soundings to see what can eventually come about. It's super interesting. Um, there's the embedding and the yeah. I'm thinking back to what Kelly Thompson was talking about with the duration of projects. I'm wondering if there's a way that the architecture could allow for the accessibility, like the, the, the getting in there and playing with something for the first time, but also like the depth Project is like eight years old now, and we're still we're just yeah. starting to get <laughs> cooking. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, if those things are going to get off the ground, it's not a yeah. That's at the research level, but also at the student level. Sometimes, often yeah. there is like a, a one or two year cycle, and you know, there's I think I've come to realize just the cycle of change in our students. I mean, some stay around for a bit longer, but um, yeah. others, <laughs> you know, like it's a, it's, it's a three-year cycle, so some people don't know about FOIA because that happened, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and so maybe how do we how do we initiate those ideas so yeah. for a new group of people? 
Yeah. yeah. So, it, yeah. It's, um, yeah. But that all takes energy and yeah. um, it does. coordination. And, yeah. and, yeah. and there's yeah. different yeah. levels yeah. of time relationships yes. as well. Like exactly. Yeah. There's the sort of initial encounter where you might go, oh, a wind tunnel. Wow, that's how they measure that? And yeah. then you walk away and you don't actually two years to work with the researcher and just see how they work and what they do and you already get an idea but then there's the more in-depth long-term kind of relations so there's this wide scale of you know ways of having those and I think in the sort of pilot phase of this project that part of the hopes is to make more of those invisible things that were behind closed doors accessible for that initial encounter. And that through those initial encounters, more choreography will happen or be instigated for longer term relations to happen. Um, and that's the sort of hope, I mean, in terms of, yeah, the project currently, too, I mean, we have two designated full-time staff that produce, install, coordinate, do the communications, the scouting, and basically we do all of the work, plus a knowledge mobilizer that helps us, which is kind of who helps us connect to the university. So, you know, it's a, it's a lean, <laughs> it's a lean machine, right? Um, so we're really lucky for ways of getting input from people on where to go. How can we uh, find more information about that, <coughs> um, what you're looking for, um, and then also some of the things that have previously transpired or that are coming up. Because that's Our, something that I struggle <laughs> yeah, with. Yeah, uh, uh, the best way to find more information is um, part of part of our initial pilot phase system is to encourage less emails in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So just come in <laughs> and talk to us. <laughs> and then uh, we can kind of go from there. Yeah. <laughs> said a minute ago also is making me think an audience and a community that we haven't really talked very much about in the Ivy Labs is alumni. And now that I'm thinking about this kind of durational situation, I think going forward it would be really it would be really important to imagine some kind of alumni residencies or alumni spaces where if some of these projects get going um, that, that will take time that we that we have a, a space for that to happen series of spaces for that to happen. Yeah, well, I think also just to have a database of those that are trained on equipment who can be hired for projects. Because that's, that's, that's mm. the, one of the big challenges is um, yeah. people who know that software, know that equipment, know that technology, graduate. You know, but but they're also looking for work. Um, yeah. how can we how can we make that bridge? Yeah. These are like some of the conversations that like I I tend to ha I, I end up having conversations with alumni. Yeah. Um, just sort of random sort of, you know, water filter, just like we're having a we're having a drink coffee or whatever. And then their conversations sort of interact are my conversations about just space and availability and time and production. And basically it, it, it ends up like we're actually discussing the exact same gripes. Yeah. And it's sort of and yeah. it's, and it's one of those things where then when it eventually happens with an alumni and a person who's working in the space, in the actual space itself, currently, is we have these, what we'll come up with these dream ideas, dream projects, dream spaces, and so mm -hmm. on. It's like, oh, it'd be great if we had this, great if that. I mean, Kelly and I had spoken about it earlier when we uh, visited uh, um, one of the buildings about like, you know, shared studio spaces, shared, uh, uh, shared uh, uh, tool spaces, and so on. That would just alleviate so many issues automatically. And these conversations come up quite a bit. I mean, uh, at least uh, a lot of long dive session. We don't need that much space. We just need to just put our stuff in the middle of that space. Yes. Do we have a tool checkout system? No, no. Well, there's, there's some groups. I think the system is not by finger discount. There are some tools for that. There are some tools for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just like to talk about a space that already exists, which is the VA building, the Fine Arts building. Uh, I just recently 
graduated from the sculpture department and I work now in the shipping business. So I spent most of my time the past four years there and I'm still spending time there. Um, I just think that it's a space that is being it's getting more and more isolated. I don't know if I can suggest any uh, solution for that or any anything to make it better, but it's I saw it getting more isolated and it's it, it's it's just completely disconnected from all of this conversation. This is happening in the EP, in the library, and that building where people, once you get in there, you're just completely disconnected. Painters, sculptors, yeah, some sculptors, they would take a course in here. But this is where a lot of fine art students are spending a lot of time, and it's, it's physically uh, disconnected because it's, there's no access in the underground, and it's far. Nobody knows but the art supplies are closed, cafe closed, so no place to communicate, no place to sit down and chat, no place to sit for nothing. I say we, I still say we, but we don't even say, see those people that are coming just to buy something. Yeah. The art supplies are closed. Um, I would say that the closing of uh, Cafe X had a big impact in that yeah. because that was a, a space yeah. where there was always something interesting happening there, yeah. something to like bring people to the building even if you don't have a class there, maybe your friend is showing some photography there so you go anyways. And it was a really nice community hub that made it feel sort of alive and there hasn't been anything to replace it really. Just a clarification, it was the, that Cafe X's were all run by the students and the students actually decided to close yeah. them. But I've heard, maybe Kelly and others know more, that the students are going to actually repurpose the Cafe X space into an open lounge. So there will be a social space again. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I, I have a little experience with that building. Uh, yeah, this year, this year when we were doing all the advertising for, for the, the convergence course that is happening here in the building, we went with posters there to, to invite people from the studio arts to, to be part of the course. And first was not panels where we could put stuff. And the places where I could put stuff, one professor came out and he told me take that stuff out because this is just a first one there. So maybe what is missing over there is a space where actually community can go and actually try to do the connection with that building, to invite that building to do things here. That's my my experience. And and it was very sad because I really wanted to have a student from that part in the course. So maybe that's something that could be improved. I, I, I just want to put it here. If any of you guys were there, <laughs> we want to go again to that building next year to do the advertising of the course. And we want people from there. And you guys have to open the door for us. <laughs> so, so this way we can do things together. Um, Joel, and then uh, after that, we have about five minutes uh, for closing comments and thoughts and aspirations. I was just going to reiterate that community space is important. I've heard that echo. Talks about casual space, uh, uh, visual, like what you can see, or you know, this, this whole. Uh, I was also thinking about just the, the public versus the private space that you know, this idea of people their, their cubbies to be into, but, but there, there needs to be more consideration of those public spaces. Uh, and, and, uh, and on that, also, just I was also thinking, we talked about this, come up a lot in the, the past, as well as this, we talked about these silos um, that everyone's in. And all I, was, I, I was thinking about that, and that there was, there are so many structures in place that force us into those silos. Um, and I think we just have to acknowledge that and, and actively be working to work to, against that. That. And I was just thinking about, uh, partly in thinking about this, you know, we talk about the silos in terms of departments, and, and, but it's, you know, the public versus private and private, there's the virtual versus the, 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 you know, like, you know, we talk about the classroom being closed off and not being able to see it. Anyways, I'll just say, finding active ways, many active ways to work against that. <laughs> A lot of the meetings and research that I did, uh, overwhelmingly, it was, and historically, we know this to be true, um, individuals who put in the extra effort uh, to break through some of those barriers to start these conversations, um, they actually do make a difference. 
but it takes a lot of the up to get it going. Um, which is pros and cons. We have a lot of adversity up ahead, but, um, but man, I really enjoyed these conversations. It really fills me with a lot of excitement and hope, and I hope you all felt the same way. Um, so on that note, uh, I'm sure some of you will be buzzing around. Uh, uh, papers on the table. Uh, the space closes at. It doesn't close, oh, but, but we're okay. done. Yeah, okay. we're done. <laughs> we're done. So you can hang out. We're done. <laughs> but we'll be done. I don't know when it closes. Anyway, um, please be sure to write your email um, and with any questions, extra things. I'll, I'll put mine at the very top. You can take it down. And thanks everyone for taking the time to come and have this conversation. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, I'll echo. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you so much for, for organizing all these. And I'm happy to say, and um, Andy and I will, will be part of a team who's communicating this in an even larger way. Um, in the last few days, we've really been thinking about how we can keep the momentum of Idea Labs um, as tied to the, to the much larger project that the whole university is undergoing, which is developing 10-year space plans for all of the faculties. So um, you'll be hearing pretty soon about the the next phase, which we're calling affectionately field work, and we will be working with a number of students who will be kind of micro consultants scattered across the faculty, um, asking and investigating questions, for particularly around space. Um, and so we're really working with students as as our kind of anthropological investigators doing field work. They will um, create public presentations to. Uh, release their findings, um, they'll scatter, ask more questions, look at other issues, and then again publicly present those. And what we hope will be most interesting about those um, soundings and findings is that we're really encouraging them to be reported back using various methodologies from the arts themselves. So this won't, these, these findings will not appear as a written report. Um, they might be photo essays, they might be a play, they might be a zine, they might be a poem. Um, but they, these findings will be um, part of trying to express back to the faculty um, uh, some, of, some of the ideas for the future that we can start to think about. Phase three then, um, this is all moving now into 2019, we are calling um, even more affectionately Moonshot. And we are going to run a major shopette, which will be hosted by a futurist. Um, and we are going to kind of propose a sci-fi faculty and imagine really, really outside the box what craziness we could get up to if, for example, we don't need email anymore because we have telepathy. Or <laughs> we don't need underground corridors because we can, um, in a Star Trek fashion, like beam ourselves from one building to the next. So anyway, it's just. We really want to um, conclude the space planning exercise with the community with a really fun, um, but but serious and imaginative shopette that we're calling the Moonshot. So um, keep your ears open and let everybody know that this will continue on and we really um, love and appreciate and respect all of your thoughts, your opinions, uh, your dreams, um, and, and everything that you're doing.